Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in this world. We're here on another very special edition of Wowza Live with a very special guest and our host, Ned Dennison from Cork, Ireland. Ned? Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. We have one of our honorees with us today, Claudio Pleet from Argentina. Claudio, I'm going to ask you to say hello to everybody, but you have the most incredible 30-year career as a professional swimmer in marathons. Unbelievable. And I want you to tell people how your training changed over the years and how your, your physical training and your mental training changed. But say hello to everybody, Claudio. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Ned. Hello, Steve. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance to, to talk with, to everybody and, and to you. It's very nice to have all the, the memories from my swimming career, which is till the, these days, uh, something which is part of my great passion that I feel for the sport. It, it was the passion that moved me every day, which is very important for me. And I share with, I think, with uh, most of the swimmers. Um, I think I, I swim in because I, it's a wave of life. It's, uh, it was a wave of living because when I started swimming as a professional swimmer in, uh, when I was 18 years old, uh, I, stopped, I stopped studying in the university. I was studying medicine in those days. And I decided to try to live from the money I make with swimming. So, it was a way of living. Then I married and I had my first child and I was swimming. So for me, it was a, a motivation uh, for, for, this, for doing uh, one way of uh, life, which it was the, way, the one I liked and I enjoyed. It, it was swimming uh, twice a day and travel in all different countries uh, where I have more uh, I met more friends that uh, swimming like me, and I we training together. And I never really thinking in a plan of life. It was just a, a one day to another day. It was one event to another event. And in that way, I guess it was the three decades, as you say. I started swimming in a, my first competition was in uh, Lake St. John in Canada in 1973. And I swim every day, I mean, every year, during those 25 years, every, every July, every end of July, it was like my, the main, the main objective of the year, training for that competition, because I knew it was my best, my best feel swimming in that cold water. Uh, but I say again, never was planned, I mean, it one, th one thing put me to the other one, and it was that passion. And uh, in those years, the 70s, the world was, uh, the swimming world was completely, in open water was completely different than it, than it became after on the 80s. Uh, as, as you can imagine, I was swimming, that was the end of the Abu Hif uh, uh, legendary time. And uh, it was swimmers who were, were uh, in one way more primitive in the way of training and swimming and in the way of feeding and in the way of life. But I was uh, 18 years old and I was uh, shocked at the way they, 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 they were. You know, they eat pitches in swimming or during swimming or the race or, or they drink coffee or they drink tea with honey. and. Uh, just in, in in the eighties, come a, a new way of uh, feeding, like drinking Gatorade at least, or 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 thinking another way of feeding, and in another way of training. But the, the fact was that I was uh, more uh, open water swimmer as uh, I grew as in a in a city uh, nearby the river, and when I was eleven years old. I went swimming in the river like the big thing, you know. Was a, it was a, uh, for a boy in that moment was a, 
to to go to go to su, to do a, an adventure uh, without measure, you know. And then when I come back from swimming in the river, you know, all my my friends was you know make me feel the importance of what, what I've been doing. So that was a way that it grew up my my uh, my passion for swimming. It was a small club of swimming and uh, in my family we have uh, the loss of my father so my grandfather he, uh, encouraged me uh, me and my brother to swim so uh when i get uh, 14 15 years old and i start swimming all those two three hour swimmings in the parana river um it was like uh, doing something really important really big really feeling good uh and when i after decided to go on Canada and swim my first uh, international swim, and and beside that great thing that it was swimming and doing something that I enjoyed, they get paid. Uh, so I find a way of living. In so suddenly uh, I was going more and more involved in that passion, and. Uh, then it come all the competitions in Europe, uh, in Capri Naples, especially where uh, Capri got with Argentina, um, got uh, uh, more communication than other part of the world because uh, the culture. We got many Italians in our uh, in our country, so it was uh, more important. And and then it come Canada. Uh, and then come uh, uh, swimming in the United States. We swim uh, in those early years, we're not swimming in Atlantic City because Atlantic City have um, a big cut of, uh, I think last time was in 1958, 58, 59, and then come back in 79. But in 73, we got uh, in Chicago swimming in uh, Michigan Lake. Uh, about the, the swimmers, uh in 74 we got the this uh j this great swimmer who was John Kinsella coming to swimming in the circuit so i i can say that personally i was i was always uh trying to beat good very good fast swimmers that they come from the pool like john so john dominate from 74 Till 78, 79, all the competition, all the major warm water competition. The only place I beat him um, was in uh, in cold water, and that was in probably in uh, in competition in Saginaw River, or he came to Mar del Plata to swim in 75. All all, all places that it was the uh, low temperature. John was not that good in cold water at the beginning. Uh, after he was getting better, but uh, that made me feel that I was better in that field. So that was how I how I was building. You know, mm -hmm. I building in interaction with another people swimming. You know, um, so every time I go to competition in the seventies or late in the seventies, when the when the water was cold, they all put my they all put my eyes on Claudio Plitt because they knew. And then, and then I wasn't sure at the beginning, but then after I accept the challenge and I play that character, you know, oh okay, I am good in this. So I keep saying, okay, I'm I'm the good in that. But the true the true is I was cold the same as anyone. I was more fat, but not that fat that then. So I played the character, and a uh, few few months ago, I got a I got a um, a confirmation of that when uh, a, a a medical doctor who is a cold water swimmer got a, a clinic in in Argentina, and he say, "Body and body, you never adapt to cold water. It's the mind who adapt to cold water." It doesn't matter. So I realized how was that character I, how, how true was that character I play? I say, okay, I'm the cold water swimmer, you know? 
and I get convinced in my, in my interior with all of my passion and my feelings that I was that, that uh, character in the cold water. Until these days, I, I had a group that uh, we go to cold water every Saturday. We swim in, in 10, 11 degrees every Saturday for 20 minutes, one mile. And we have fun. Uh, but one thing that I, I learned is that you feel better when you're not going along. I mean, you feel good when you share with other people that, that uh, shock of the cold and the possibility to, to interact with other people and talk and, and have uh, go and back feelings about, oh, how cold, and you, you go out and you speak and, and you comment and everything. And all my, all my points going to, in this part of my life, I mean, I'm young, I'm 65 years old, but I'm thinking what we have in common what we have in common, all marathon swimmers, and I have to the, to the way of think that we, we belong to a long chain of evolution in the sport. And we have probably a think in one moment, you know, our egos think, oh, I am the best in this. Oh, I, I win this, I won that. But it doesn't matter what you win or who, more, who win more things. It, it, it does in one part, in one part of the game. But in the other part, it's, it's all the memories, all the good time you have. And, and then in, in, in my moment, in the moment that I have in my life, it's very important to be part of, of that change. You know, what, to be one of those links in the in the marathon swimming, uh, big ADN, we can call it. And those memories go to, you know, when uh, Matthew Webb crossed the English Channel for the first time in, a, in 1875. And uh, uh, in Argentina, before that, it's very, it's very important because we have swimmers before. And it was the the ancient uh, cultures in the Tierra del Fuego, in the south of the country. Uh, in the Beagle Strait, we got the Jamanas. They was uh, the, the native girls who were swimmers. I went last year for a little swim there in, uh, in those waters, five degrees water. We have an event and uh, we swim for 10 minutes in, in five degrees. And uh, I was investigating in books and in places all the influence we got from those native cultures. And uh, amazing me, amazing me that they, that, uh, uh, that Indians girls was the one who uh, was in charge to get into the water for the canoes in that water. And uh, there are many stories about the girls having the baby going up in the, in the shoulders and the head because uh, they, they always take care of the babies. And, and they was, uh, of course, taking the care of the babies and doing the, the food and, and, and fishing things. And the men was not able to swim because the men was all the time hunting, going up on the mountain. So if they go in the water, they just sink because they was, they were so strong in legs. It was like putting a, putting a, a, play, a football player in the water. So uh, that, that was our roots in one Claudio, way. Claudio, as a, as a, a traditional swimmer, I'm, I've never been a professional, I never will be a professional. When I look at the professional races from, from your years, there's just three big ones, three races that I would, uh, to, to even have swum in them, much less won them, is Lexa Jean, Santa Fe, Corona, and Capri Napoli. There are people listening who don't know who you are. How did you do in those? Did you ever win any of those, Claudio? Yeah. Uh, I, I think... And, uh, and how, many, how many times each? Okay. As I say, I swim Lake St. John 
20, 20, 25 times. And then I make a return in 2004 when I was 50. I win five times Lake St. John's. And then I swim 15 times in Capri and I win four. And then I swim Santa Fe Gironda for 14 times and I win four times. And uh, I, got, I got many seconds. And if I have to remember all one of those, I don't know the whole number, but probably around 60, I think it, I have to remember 1985, because in, uh, in 1985, the organization decided to go back and forth. The race was during 35 years, was uh, only one way 32K. And I went, that year we went 64K. They put a good price money for six swimmers. They start at 10 o'clock at night and swim to the other side of the lake, the lake the whole night. The city called it Peribonka from Robert Ball. And then go to Peribonka and come back to, to Robert Ball in the hardest swim I ever swim in my life. Definitely, if I have to say, a really, really hard swim was Lake St. John. Only three, swim, three swimmers finished the race. I finished in 18 hours, 45 minutes. And Philip Rush from New Zealand finished in, in eight, one minute after, 46 minutes. But it was a matter of, of nothing because we changed we change places during 17 hours racing each other. Uh, one time, 10 meters, 20 meters, like this. It was a, a, time, a matter of head and, and luck because I was at the end in a little bit shape than him. I think Paul Asmuth, when we interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, he said uh, that was the first time he didn't finish a swim. He got out of the swim because he knew no one would finish. And then many hours later, they, they kind of got him and said, you know, they're coming in now. And he, he said he couldn't believe it. He said it was the last time he ever got out of a swim. Um, there are um, honor swimmers in the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame who probably got in because they won Capri once. You won these big races multiple times. If you had to pick your favorite race of those three, you have uh, – uh, Santa Fe in your in your own country. I know you have a special feeling for Napoli, and you're a superstar in um, in Quebec. If you had to pick one of those races, what's your favorite? Now my favorite is Lake Saint John, definitely because I I I learn how to speak some French with the people there. I make a lot of friends. They really make me feel like I was in home or in a place that I was in another life. I don't know but I get really close of that people. My country was, of course, Argentina, and uh, it was very proud, and, and, and Italy was like home, but Canada was uh, an old story, it was going out and, and discover a new world for me. And it was a place that always, always feel good, and, and, and it because it was a place where the things could be hard. And I was playing my character to be the good in the difficult, you know. But I, I mean, I, as I say, so I definitely pick up Lake St. John. Uh, I, also, it was a be the best prize money for many years. <laughs> how, did, how, how, how did you become a professional swimmer at age 18? How did you even know this existed? Who helped you? Who told you? Well, it was a friend, Carlos Aguirre from Santa Fe. He was before in the circuit in the year of uh, Horacio Iglesias, another uh, good swimmer from Argentina who won five time Lake St. John too. And the truth was, he lived in a country as Argentina, the up and downs of the economy. When I was doing a couple of thousand of dollars, you know, any salary was a hundred dollars because of the, all the catastrophic uh, inflation of the economy. So if you come back with, with some amount of money, it never happened in the States or some countries of Europe. But yes, in South America, in the 70s and in the 80s, with 10,000, you can live easy one year. Not, a, not anymore, not now. You probably need 10,000 10, for a month. But in those years, it makes you, you know, thinking that for a boy of 18 years, well, okay, 
do this and then go back to study my medicine because my father was a doctor. My brother is a doctor, but I never go back. Never go back. <laughs> but I don't regret. My brother, who is a doctor, say you the you you the one who make the right decision, because I've been travel all around. I've been enjoying very much. So I think it was. Uh, but the, that decision was coming mainly because I got that passion for swimming, and and put all all my effort in swimming. I was not physically doted. I mean, I was not, uh, I was a strong in mind, but I, I was not the fastest, fastest as Paul Asmuth or, or James or, Kins, or John Kinsella, but I was playing the character to be always steady there and trying, you know, a good second, a good third, but if the condition were not, no good, I will be there, in, in, you know, so that made me good good top three in many international races on, in, in about 50 countries. It sounds like you, you made some good friends. Uh, James Kegley talks about coming to visit you and staying in Argentina. And, and Igor D'Azusa from Brazil talks about you coming to Dover with him. T tell us um, how you knew Igor and why an Argentinian is going to travel to Dover to help a Brazilian. And, and it was an easy swim. Yeah, you go immediately, good conditions, and you swim. Or was there some drama? Oh, it was uh, because we were, in that time, probably, we, we was like, uh, hey, come to me to train into Argentina. And then Igor come to train into Mexico. I was living in Mexico for a while. And then I, I went to training with him to Brazil. And I go visit James Kegley in, in Washington. And then James came... Uh, uh, to Amar del Plata, and uh, it was a way of travel in those days. I think it's very much like today, you know, because I have uh, many swimmers who are doing about the same, which is beautiful, which is the more enjoyable part, training together. You do what you like it, you stay with friends, and then, you know, if you don't have the the, the, the way to, to pay for your expenses and then you visit the friend and you stay there and it's the, the best way to know the, any place so I be, we became friends but uh, we was all the, the all day speaking about swimming and uh, in the, in uh, in a way to help your friend you say okay I can coach you in England or I can coach you in uh, in, uh, in Italy or they coach me and I coach them I coach Igor in Manhattan uh, so this this way of changing role, it was great because uh, uh, I think it's somebody who knows you. He can make a good work on the boat better than anyone, and you can beside uh, enjoy the the time, you know. And and describe uh, your experiences with uh, Igor in Dover. How many times did you have to go over? What were the conditions like? Okay, we went uh, with Igor in 1993. Uh, he had a, a non crossing because he, he was he was cold and got no good a good day. And then we we'll go back in uh, 1995 for for the second cross. And just uh, that night, after three weeks, we was going back definitely. We say okay, tomorrow we have the fly. So that night. We go out, we go late in bed, we prepare the bags, everything. And the next morning, we hear a noise in the window on the glass, and it was uh, Rich Brickle, the, the, the pilot of the boat, saying, hey, come on, come on, we go swimming now. And the, the weather changed suddenly. So we look at each other and say, what are we doing now? Uh, Igor asked me, I said, yes, let's go. So I prepared the thermos and everything, go to the harbor, jump in the boat, go to Dover, and he swim 11 hours in the first cross he, he could uh, achieve. Two years after, he get much better, much prepared, training very much, better in mind. So he say, I got a sponsor for the flight ticket, Claudio, we go there. So... Um, we went there, and in the first try, he go in his back and forth in 18 hours and half in a beautiful, beautiful swim for him. 
and he was really, really happy. After that, he was uh, coaching till this day for many, many swimmers. Same as me, I coach uh, about 15 swimmers uh, during the last 20 years. And uh, we enjoy very much because it's a way to keep in the, in the, to keep in the sport, you know. But I was an organizer of swimming. Of, um, I organized a, a FINA com competition in La Patagonia, Vietnam for 12 years. And I organized also Rosario, a, a, uh, a competition of 60K on the river. Uh, I organized Mar del Plata. Miramar Mar del Plata, who was in international. And uh, the experience is that uh, I can coach and I can organize, but I really like swimming more than uh, anything. You, you talked about uh, John Kinsella being dominant. How do you compare his position in the sport to Peter Strachev? Well, as I say, if you think uh, who is the best, it will be very hard to say because domination it was a kind of uh, a quality of uh, marathon swimming so it was paul paul asmut dominating john kinsella dominating uh and peter steichev or or stefan leca who was a good uh, you know good many years dominating or, or diego de gano from my country it was a kind of a kingdom you know for a while uh, it doesn't matter if what two, three, five, or ten years. You know, we all part of that chain of uh, of marathon swimming. I mean, it's so hard. Or Horacio Iglesias was five time winner of Lake St. John, and I can say also that the water was colder forty years ago ago than it than it is now. Either the English Channel is not the swim swimming in the in the English Channel or Lake St. John in the seventies and swimming in in the in the present time. Water was two, three degrees colder. I, I go last year to, to, to the English Channel and jump in 19 degrees water or 18 something. And I remember in the 70s going, it was like 13 or 14 degrees. So the world has changed. But I, I think everything is it's a, good, it's a good way to explain how the thing was. But domination was, uh, for years, it was a... Uh, Equality in marathon swimming, you know, because somebody sometimes are some swimmers were ahead in preparation and in mind of the others, you know. But when the things was called, they change. It changed. Uh, where did the definition of, of swimming marathon swimming and the cold is part of, or or the unpredictable uh, situation. That's that's a good part. Uh, now we have the 10K at the Olympics, which is it's good. Yes, I, I'm very happy that we have it, but I'm not completely sure if this is what I like it. You know, I'm watching after watching Rio, and it is it's a, a sport of a full contact, where you don't you don't think about the waves or the cold, or you don't think about the current. You're just thinking. Who is beside you, which elbow or which, uh, you know, I mean, it changed. I accept it. It's, it's what we have. But I mean, it's not what I would like for, to see in the future. If we think in Matthew Webb in 1875, and if you think the Matthew Webb and, and the cross was, the, the first Olympic was many years after, you know, so in roots, in, in history, we were before the Olympics as a sport, you know. But, you know, all, I always think that swimming marathon is an, uh, is an external adventure, a beautiful external adventure. But it has an internal adventure beside, you know, para, uh, going, going in your mind. And that's the important part. I consider myself more a mental swimmer. And I mean, the, the main part of swimming is what happened inside of you. If not, nothing happened in your life. If you think, oh, I beat that, I beat, I win that, and you, you cannot live with that. But you can live with what you have learned from when you put your, your body, your life, 
and your ego in that challenge. And that's the, the, the important part. Steve, why don't you join us for a moment? You, you told me a story one time about swimming with Claudio in Canada, where they, 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 they told you had kind of one more mile to go and you guys were having a conversation while you were swimming. Bring back uh, that memory for us. Yeah, it was in Canada. It was two times. It was Atlantic City toward the end and yep. uh, Cabo San Lucas in the middle. And, yes. Uh, um, in both cases, uh, at the end, uh, Claudio beat me. I, I realized how tough he was. I knew how tough he was before. Um, he talks about his cold water character. He was huge. I mean, his, his character was real life. Even before I went on the circuit, we knew about Claudio and his reputation. We knew that he had beaten, uh, <laughs> John Kinsella, this Olympic champion in cold water. And so when I'm swimming stroke for stroke, in my mind, if I really think about it, I said, there is no way I can beat Claudio. <laughs> I'll try to get close and it'll be fun, but he's the hero, he's the icon. And, and when, but I'm swimming and uh, I remember in Atlantic City, I looked over him and he was breathing one way, I was breathing another and we're going and going. I think I can go faster, but I have to be very tactical about Claudio. I can't swim now because he will swim faster. Yeah. And every time I thought, okay, now I'll shift the gear and go faster. Claudio just, I thought he was smiling at me and he goes, <laughs> oh, you want to race now? <laughs> and I went faster, Claudio goes faster. I go yeah. faster, Claudio goes faster. I go Claudio. And I, I looked up at the finish and I could see the finish. And I think Claudio was waiting for me to look at the finish. Yeah. And that's when Claudio then went <laughs> much faster. And then I remember another time in Mexico and uh, because my father could speak Spanish, uh, Claudio's boat said um, it was very warm and we had to drink and, and Claudio and me are also very, very close to one another. And his boat, I don't know if it was his boat or Claudio said, no, no more drinking. They just wanted to race. And I looked up my father and he told me, I said, if Claudio doesn't drink, I won't drink. <laughs> of course, <laughs> Claudio could do this. <laughs> I could not. It, I, and I'm thinking, my whole body hurts, my whole body hurts. And I'm looking and he goes, this is my hero. If he can do it, I can do it. And, and anyway, uh, the memories I have of, of Claudio as a friend, a mentor, a uh, fellow competitor are great. Again, we were racing. He wanted money, I wanted money. He wanted to win, I wanted to win. But he still gave me advice. He still would tell me little things, you know, when you swim the race, make sure you look here or, or this. And, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, this is a, a very special man who would give me advice. I mean, we would be walking to the starting line <laughs> and Claudio would give me advice. And I, I'd be so surprised that I go, why do you do this? And, but he did that for everybody, male, female. And I remember with, with um, uh, uh, Paul Asmuth, at the end of the um, race, the two-way crossing, 64 kilometers in, in Lake St. John. And all we heard on the shore was um, Philip Rush and Claudio, Philip and Claudio, Philip and Claudio. And we, this was two giants. This was Poseidon and Neptune yeah. going to one another. <laughs> And, you know, it was incredible to be there to see these two giants of the sport going one right after another. And, and I, I feel my life is very fulfilled because I know Claudio and because he was such an inspiration. Thank Claudio? you, Claudio. Claudio, you, you. Should be you should be ashamed of yourself dominating the young boy like that. You should be ashamed <laughs> of yourself. You were I taking advantage of your experience. You too. I dominate the heart. Yes, because I communicate with the heart. I mean, it's something that I think is is important to to go. On, I mean, to help anyone. And I it's true. In those days, I always was 
trying to give. Same as today. It's, it's a natural and probably I grow up with that. My mother, I don't know. But I think it's when you get uh, when you get in, in communicate with another uh, competitor, I mean, you are more close and it doesn't matter the result. It doesn't matter who wins. I mean, it's no win or lose. It's not the game of winning or lose. It's a game to be there together and share this. You know, that's that's permit us to talk about that. And I'm very, I'm very emotionally touched. Thank you, Steve. I think it's uh is what I probably like to hear better. You know, I don't have any trophy. I forget about the efforts. I about I forget about the the. The money, I, I only got in mind and in heart all your words because that's the best, the best thing you have, can have in any experience in life. I mean, and I remember all that, all, the, all those tactics I use in swimming. When I remember in Los Cabos, when I say stop drinking because I knew how long time I have and I don't want to lose no one little second to beat you. <laughs> you know? No one little second. And in, in Atlantic City, when we race, it's true. I always was trying to make you know, to make you understand that I want to win. <laughs> but it was a game, you know. Yes. And every day is a game. And we have to be happy to play the game. And all those uh, tactics, it comes from, from a game. I mean, something that I, I enjoyed very much. And same as you. And it gave you always good memory. Sometimes you finish a race and you say, if you win, and you think, I, I wish we all win, <laughs> you know, because swimming is, is very mathematic, first, second, third, four, five. But, you know, the truth is everybody was there. You know, that's the, that's the rule of the sport. But everybody were there putting the, the best. Yeah. I want to... I wanna... Uh, Go ahead, Steve. One thing that I thought that Claudio perfectly um, described, um, and I, I would love to hear uh, his explanation in Spanish, his native tongue. And, and when he explained it, marathon swimming was an external adventure and an internal adventure. And I, I've never heard it described this way, but it is perf it's a perfect definition of you know, externally fighting against the cold and the wind and the waves and the internal <laughs> challenge of telling yourself, I'm tired, I'm cold, I want to get out. I mean, this is a, a, a very um, wonderful uh, definition and description of our sport. So thank you again, Claudio. Uh, thank Claudio. you. Thank you. Claudio, I will say, we will say goodbye now. I want to thank you very much for your time. We have spoken about John Kinsella's period of domination, Paul Asmus period of domination, um, Petr Stroichov's do period of domination. But Claudio, you were dominant for nearly 30 years. You are, is, will never be another swimmer like you. So thank you very much for your time. Today. I will. Thank you. <laughs>